Hello, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar um, providing an overview of key updates on the uh, regulation 1107. Um, just a quick introduction from me and uh, then I'll hand over to Karen. So this is a 30 minute webinar um, and if you have any questions throughout the webinar please post them in the questions tab which should be on the right hand side of your screen. Um, what I'll do is at the end of the webinar, I'll, po I'll put the questions to uh, Karen and we'll have about 10-15 uh, minutes, uh, depending on the number of questions at the end um, of the webinar. If you have any um, issues and you want to chat to myself privately, then um, please use the chat function um, or the question tab is up to you and um, we'll try and resolve it during the webinar. Um, I think that's it from me, so I'll hand straight over to you, Karen, and um, yeah, we can get started. Okay, thank you. Um, so hi, everybody, and uh, my name's Karen Baker. Um, basically, what we're going to be doing here is just going to a small section of uh, the training course that I do on registration of agrochemicals in Europe on behalf of Informa. Um, so hopefully this will just give you um, a quick snippet of, uh, of the topics that are covered in the training course. So we'll just start off first with a little bit of history before we get into the um, detail of the presentation. And, uh, and so this is just really asking why we need the regulation 1107-2009. Um, well, looking historically, uh, prior to 1991, there was actually no harmonized system for the registration of agrochemicals within the EU. And then back in 1991, Directive 91414, um, which probably most of you have heard of, was adopted. And in 1993, that directive actually entered into force. At that point, the range of abilities of the different member states was, uh, was quite large. Um, you had some countries which had a already established, um, you know, good and quite robust regulatory system, and some countries which had a, uh, a very scant regulatory system, not really requiring much data at all. So we had a lot of um, variation in the extent of the legislation within the EEC at that time. And so Directive 91414 really gave us the rules in terms of what we needed to follow for the registration of agrochemicals. But at that point, there was actually no detailed guidance or data requirements that were put in place. And really, as time went on, we developed that guidance and developed the data requirements the other point to note is that when Directive 91414 was first introduced, there were actually just 12 member states within the EU. And uh, as you all know, the number of member states is now more than double that. So really the size of the EU has changed hugely as well since the Directive 91414 was put into place. Also, since the initial directive was put into place, there's been a lot of the EU legislation that has come into force. We've got new concepts such as the Water Framework Directive and the Environmental Action Programme. We have this new idea about endocrine disruptors. They hadn't been thought about when Directive 91414 was first uh, conceived. We've got new rules for classification and labelling. And also EFSA has been formed. So again, when 91414 came into place, EFSA didn't actually exist. So really what the regulation 1107-2009 aims to do is to bring together all the experience that we've developed since the Directive 91414 was first put into place. So it tries to bring together all the scientific and technical developments that have occurred and also to take into account the experience that we've gained while Directive 91414 was in force. And so hopefully, Regulation 1107 provides the rigorous regulation that we actually need today. And the fact that it's a regulation rather than a directive means that it is directly enacted across all of the member states. So that means that it's going to be applied consistently between all the different countries within the EU. So what we're going to do in this webinar is we're just going to take a look at a 
couple of the key changes that exist within Regulation 1107-2009 compared to that which was covered by the uh, Directive 91414. And so what we're going to look at here is this new concept of the cutoff criteria and we're also going to talk briefly about comparative risk assessment and substitution. The points that are grayed out we won't be covering within this webinar. So we'll start off first by looking at the cutoff criteria. A cutoff criteria, as I said, is a, is a new concept and it's a totally hazard-based system. So there's no assessment of risk when deciding whether your substance is going to meet the cutoff criteria. The details of the cutoff criteria are found within Annex 2 to the Regulation 1107 and they're detailed in uh, the points shown on the slide. So first we're looking at human health. There is no approval allowed for mutagens, category 1A and 1B, unless there's negligible exposure. There's no approval allowed for carcinogens, category 1A and 1B, and um, that's regardless of exposure. There's no approval allowed for reprotoxins, category 1A and 1B, unless there's negligible exposure. And just to clarify, category 1A means that it's known to be a mutagen, carcinogen or reprotoxin, and category 1B means that it's presumed to be a mutagen, carcinogen or reprotoxin. And then we've also got this new idea of endocrine disruptors, and we have no approval allowed for endocrine disruptors unless there's negligible exposure. And it's important to note that this is if the classification is or is to be. And it's also important to note that this is based on the official ECHA classification. So you could actually find yourself in the situation where, for example, your data shows that your substance isn't carcinogenic, but somebody else has generated a study which shows that your substance is carcinogenic, that study would then likely trigger ECHA to officially classify your substance as carcinogenic, which would mean that your substance was then subject to the cutoff criteria, i.e. it couldn't be approved. So uh, it's very important to realize it's not just what your data is showing, it is based on what the official classification is or is to be. Um, moving on to the environmental side, we have no approval allowed for persistent organic pollutants, which are commonly known as POPs. We've got no approval for persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances, which are commonly known as PBTs. And we've got no approval for very persistent and very bioaccumulative substances, which are commonly known as BPVBs. So just to expand on what would actually trigger a uh, classification as a, a POP, a PBT, or a VPVB. Um, so looking firstly at POPs, we need to fulfill all three criteria for persistence by accumulation and potential for long-range transport. So if you only meet one or two of the criteria, you don't qualify as a POP. You have to fulfill all three of the criteria. And so for persistence, we're looking at a DT50 in water greater than two months, DT50 in soil greater than six months, or a DT50 in sediment greater than six months. For the bioaccumulation criteria, we're looking at a bioconcentration factor greater than 5,000, or if we don't have bioconcentration factor data available, a log POW greater than five, or if there are any other reasons for concern, such as high bioaccumulation in other non-target species, high toxicity or high ecotoxicity, although what is actually meant by high toxicity or high ecotoxicity isn't defined within the regulation. And then the final criteria for a POP, long-range transport. So here we're looking at if there's any measured levels at a distant location that is of potential concern. Uh, if monitoring data show long-range transport uh, may have occurred, or if the environmental fate properties or modeling results demonstrate that the active substance safeness or synergist has a potential for long-range transport to air, uh, 
which basically means that if your DT50 in air is greater than two days, then that would trigger a concern for long-range transport. Then moving on to PBTs, in order to qualify as a PBT, you need to fulfill, again, all three criteria for persistence, bioaccumulation, and toxicity. So this time for bioaccumulation, if the bioconcentration factor is greater than 2,000, you'll trigger that criteria. So you may remember that previously for the POP, it was greater than 5,000. So we have a different trigger here for the bioconcentration factor. And similarly for persistence, we have a series of DT50 cutoffs in uh, water, uh, sediment, and soil. Again, slightly different to what there was previously. And then for toxicity, um, if we have a long-term NOEC, no observed effect concentration, for marine or freshwater organisms below 0 0.01 milligrams per litre, or if the substance is classified as carcinogenic, mutagenic, or toxic to reproduction, or if there's evidence for chronic toxicity um, indicating a classification for specific target organ toxicity, RE1 or RE2, um, according to the regulation for classification and labeling. And then finally, we move on to VPVBs. So in order to qualify as a VPVB, you need to fulfill both the criteria for persistence and bioaccumulation. This time for bioaccumulation, we're back to the bioconcentration factor greater than 5,000. And again, for persistence, we've got a series of DT50s that would um, trigger fulfilling the criteria for water, sediment, and soil, which you can see on the slide. Um, just to say that there is a derogation, so it may be that you do meet all of the cutoff criteria, um, but for some reason your substance is actually required. So we have a derogation within the regulation that allows for this situation. Um, but in terms of planning for your, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in terms of planning for approval of your substance. I certainly wouldn't be looking to rely on this derogation um, in order to obtain approval for your substance. Um, it is worth bearing in mind that this derogation is present. So we're looking at if there's a serious danger to plant health, which can't be controlled by any other means other than your substance, in which case we get a derogation that your substance could be approved, but it would be for a limited period of less than five years and we'd really be needing to look at how we would minimize any exposure. You can't apply this derogation if your substance is classified as carcinogen or reprotoxin category 1A or a carcinogen category 1B without any threshold, and it also doesn't apply to endocrine disruptors. So you'll be looking at a community approval only in really exceptional circumstances. So as I say, don't rely on this for the approval of your active substance. And so just to summarize um, the criteria that we've just discussed in terms of meeting the cutoff criteria. So for human health, we can have no approval for carcinogens category 1A or 1B unless it's negligible exposure no approval for mutagens category 1A or 1B, no approval for toxic or, uh, sorry, toxic to reproduction active substances category 1A or 1B unless there's negligible exposure, and no approval for endocrine disruptors unless there's negligible exposure. And in the environmental side, there's no approval for PBTs, POPs, BPVBs, or endocrine disruptors. And the important point to note is that this will only come into force at renewal. So only when your active substance goes through the renewal process will the cutoff criteria be applied. So if your substance currently meets the cutoff criteria but isn't currently going through the review process, then it will continue to be approved until it actually is up for renewal. Then we also have this new concept of candidates for substitution. And if your substance qualifies as a candidate for substitution, it will be listed separately within Regulation 1107. 
If you have a candidate for substitution, the approval period will be reduced and it will be for a period of up to 10 years. That's compared to 10 years for a standard active substance and 15 years at renewal of a standard active substance. And candidates for substitution can be renewed for periods of up to seven years. So you do have a significantly reduced approval period if you qualify as a candidate for substitution. So the conditions for qualifying as a candidate for substitution are again detailed in Annex 2 to Regulation of 1107-2009. Um, if you classified as carcinogenic, toxic to reproduction, um, endocrine disruptor, then you will be a candidate for substitution. You remember that these criteria were also detailed in the cutoff criteria, but we had the caveat of negligible exposure, which means that, um, that we could find ourselves in the situation where it was carcinogenic and negligible exposure, so we had the approval, but then we would still trigger um, being a candidate for substitution. Um, and the other important point to note is that if you meet two out of the three criteria to be considered as a, a PBT, so persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substance, then you will again um, meet the criteria to be a candidate for substitution. We then move on to some more vague criteria. Um, so within the regulation, it states that if you have a significantly lower ADI, which is acceptable daily intake, ARFD, which is the acute reference dose, or AOEL, which is the acceptable operator exposure level, then the majority of substances within groups of substances or use categories, then you'll qualify as a candidate for substitution. Unfortunately, in the regulation, they omitted to define in what they meant by groups of substances or use categories. And so they subsequently looked at this and finally decided that this means basically the 21 different use categories as defined within the EU pesticides database. So this is things like fungicide, herbicide, insecticide, and so on. Um, they also omitted to define what was meant by significantly lower. Uh, and again, they went away and looked at this, and they looked at various different options, such as a percentile cutoff, a fifth percentile, for example, um, or absolute cutoff values. They realized that if they applied a percentile um, value, then if people removed that substance from the EU because it was a candidate for substitution, they didn't want to support it, the percentile would gradually creep up and creep up and creep up, meaning that more and more substances were affected. So they finally decided on absolute uh, criteria for the candidate for substitution. And these are shown on the slide for the ADI, ARFD, and AOEL. You also qualify as a candidate for substitution if there are reasons for concern, which are linked to the nature of critical effects, which cannot be controlled by risk mitigation measures. And again, they didn't define um, what was meant by critical effects within the regulation. And finally, after reviewing this, they decided that this meant that if you were a developmental neurotoxin or if there were immunotoxic effects, then that was meant by um, that was what was meant by critical effects, and then also you qualify as a candidate for substitution if your substance contains a significant proportion of non-active isomers. So surprise, surprise, they didn't define within the regulation what was meant by a significant proportion, and when they went away and looked at this, they realised actually, apart from two substances, which was Mecaprop and metalaxyl, they actually didn't know whether the most substances contained active or inactive isomers. And the only reason that they knew for these two substances was because the active isomers, mecaprop P and metalaxyl M, are also registered. So based on the limited information, they decided that a significant proportion meant 50% inactive isomer. 
and you will notice within the regulation that we now have some new requirements to really look at um, whether the isomers are active or inactive and what proportions are present in your substance. Um, so this may potentially be an area that changes in the future, but for now it's defined as 50% inactive isomer. Um, so taking into account the criteria that we've just discussed, meaning that your substance would qualify as a candidate for substitution, um, they've gone away and looked at all the substances that are approved under Regulation 540 2011. These are the substances which were approved prior to the 1st of January 2013, meaning that they were approved under the old Directive 91414 and then by way of this regulation were deemed to be approved under Regulation 1107. They've gone away and obtained the review report from the Commission, the EFSA conclusion report, the draft assessment reports that were written by the um, RMSs, and they've also looked at the classification labeling regulation. So they've gone away and collated all the relevant data on the active substances uh, to look to see which ones qualify as candidates for substitution. So other substances which have been approved since the 1st of January 2013 will be assessed at a later date. And when they went away and looked at those 340 substances, they found that 77 of those substances qualified as candidates for substitution. And I've just put here a link to a web page where you can actually find that draft list of candidates for substitution. So as I said, the list is based on the data that have already been reviewed and uh, obviously the data will be amended at renewal. They will take into account any new data that are, are available. Um, so the current list won't affect any current approval periods. It won't affect any existing product authorizations. It won't affect any ongoing applications or ongoing reauthorizations. But what we do have to bear in mind is that uh, if there are any substances on that list that qualify as a candidate for substitution, we do now need to think about comparative assessment. And so if we qualify as a candidate for substitution and that substance is included in a plant protection product, then each member state needs to perform an assessment to see whether that plant protection product should be authorized in its member state. The comparison is done on a member state by member state basis. It's not done on a zonal basis. Um, that's because each specific use is specific to that member state and also the profile of products which are registered in each member state will differ. So you can't necessarily apply a substitution of one product for another across the whole of the zone. So when you make an application for authorization of a product, you'll now need to include a proposal as to whether your product should be substituted under the comparative assessment rules. And there's a Sanko guidance document which actually describes the procedure that you'll need to follow. And some member states have also produced their own guidance and their own templates for doing this. Basically looking at it, most of the member states are looking to exclude products as quickly and easily as they can. And so they've come up with a hierarchy of assessments that you need to make. Um, trying to remove most products at an early stage so that we don't need to go very far down the line. As you're probably aware, this has come from the, um, particularly from the Nordics within the northern zone, and so within the northern zone, they are going to be more stringent in terms of making their assessment, uh, and uh, some of the countries do actually require that you do the comparative assessment even if you don't have a, a candidate for substitution within the northern zone. If you have any new products, then five years need to be allowed for experience with new products. So if you're making an application for a new product which contains a candidate for substitution, 
then you don't need to make a comparative assessment. And similarly, you can't substitute an existing product with a new product if that's been authorized for a period of less than five years. Um, as I mentioned, it's optional for products that don't contain candidates for substitution. That's something that countries like Sweden are going to be requesting. And it's also not required for amateur use products. So just summarizing here the criteria that we need to consider um, when making a comparative assessment to see whether our project needs to be substituted with a inverted commas safer alternative. So the first thing we need to think about is whether the alternatives provide enough methods and enough chemical diversity to minimize the risk of occur uh, sorry, occurrence of uh, resistance in the target organism. So again, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, in order to minimize the risk of resistance, we need to have as many different modes of action as possible. Um, the fewer the modes of action for the active substance mechanism on a target organism, the more likely it is that it will become resistant to that mode of action, meaning that the substance no longer works. The alternative needs to be significantly safer for human health or for the environment, and it has to be a like-for-like -like comparison. So you can't look at one product which is um, you know, a high risk for human health and substitute it with a, another product that's maybe got a better environmental profile. It has to be a straight like for like comparison. So if you had a problem with the human health risk profile, the alternative would need to have a significantly better human health risk profile and the risk to the environment would need to be the same um, or better than uh, this product that you're looking to substitute. You have to have gained sufficient experience with the alternative. So as I said, that's a minimum of five years experience needs to have been gained. You need to check whether the risks to man and the environment are significantly lowered. So you're looking at things like a factor of 10 difference in the toxicity exposure ratios, for example. You also need to consider whether there are any practical um, or economic economic disadvantages. So that would be things like, for example, a herbicide could always be substituted with hand weeding, um, but that would be a significant um, practical and economic disadvantage for the farmer. So uh, the substitutions have to be uh, practical for the farmer to actually use. And finally, we need to ensure that minor uses are protected. So, uh, so if your product is authorized for a minor use, then uh, it's likely that you won't need to substitute your product. And before you can actually make a substitution, then all, all of these conditions need to be met before substitution can apply. So if only some of the criteria are met, then we can't substitute the product containing the candidate for substitution for a supposedly safer alternative. We have to meet all of those conditions before substitution can apply. So in terms of what we mean by a significant difference in risk, we need to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we need to make sure we take all types of exposure to different population subgroups into account. And as I said, for the environment, a factor of at least 10 difference for the toxicity exposure ratios needs to exist. And as I also mentioned, if there's no significant difference in human health or the environment, then a comparative assessment is not needed. And if one is significantly better in one area, the other, in the other area, then you can't um, apply comparative assessment as there's no scientific method on which uh, you can judge substitution. So hopefully that was um, a useful quick tour through the new cutoff criteria and candidates for substitution, which is covered in the uh, Regulation 1107. And um, just moving on to any questions now. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, we do have one question come in uh, whilst you were talking. Um, is there already any, an example of a product substituted um, due to CA? 
Um, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, it's only been ongoing for a short time. It became compulsory at the start of this year. And as I say, it only applies for um, applications for authorizations of products made um, from the start of this year going forward. So it won't be retrospectively applied. So I would expect that the answer is no, because it would normally take a year to 18 months before that first authorization came through. But the honest answer is I don't know whether it has actually been applied um, according to these new rules under this new regulation. Great, thank you. Um, someone's asked here, could Karen repeat the explanation on the last requirement of the comparative assessment on minor uses protection? Um, this one here. So, so basically, we have to ensure that minor uses are, are protected. This is something that is um, comes up in several places within the regulation, and that they're looking to support having products available uh, for use on minor crops. Um, it's something that companies have not really wanted to invest in because the financial returns for minor crops are, are quite small. And, um, and, and so the idea behind this criteria is that we're really looking to make sure that maybe we have a product that is used on cereals and it's also used on maybe cabbages. Um, we need to make sure that if that product maybe has a safer alternative that could be used on cereals, it doesn't get substituted because then we would lose the use on cabbages. So, uh, so it's really looking at making sure that minor uses are protected, and it is something that uh, some member states have put in their guidance that basically you look quite early on whether your product contains a minor use on the label, and, and if so, then they don't expect that you'll go any further with your assessment. Thank you for that. Um, for another question here, how often and when will the CFS list be updated? Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Uh, how often and when will the CFS uh, list be updated? Candidates for substitution. Um, well, that list, as I said, covers the substances covered by the Directive 540. Um, going forwards, as those substances go through the EU review programme, each substance will be reassessed as it goes through the review program and it will be detailed within the implementing directive that um, allows for the approval of the substance whether or not it qualifies as a candidate for substitution. So it will be something that, that starts to be evolving if you like as the substances go through the review process. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, someone said here, but uh, in the conference in Barcelona last year, some authorities said that they can apply for, can apply the substitution for some use, but not others within the same product, and therefore keep minor uses, but not authorised other uses. Yeah, I mean, this is... Um one of the differences that is occurring between different member states. It depends how pro the member states are for this candidate for substitution process. So as I say, some member states will actually stop at the point that you have a minor use um, and not take the assessment any further. Some member states, as I say, particularly in the northern zone, are quite pro this process. They're the ones who have really pushed it, and so they will be more stringent in terms of how they apply it. So it is going to be a case of um, we'll gain experience as we go through it. It is a relatively new thing that we're dealing with. And so uh, I think as it plays out, unfortunately, we'll, we'll gain the experience as to how it is finally going to work. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here. Can you repeat your experience uh, slash advice on the process of um, comparative assessment for the northern zone, how far is it different to C zone or N zone to C zone? 
yeah, central zone. Um, I'm not sure that I can really answer that that question. I'm afraid because I um, I've actually got very little experience of of actually making the assessments for for the um, various different countries, especially within the central zone, where uh, you know there, there are a large number of countries involved. Um, but as I say, as a as a general summary, the northern zone is going to be um, much more strict in terms of the requirements. They are going to be looking at doing the voluntary comparative assessment, um, even if you don't have a candidate for substitution. So um, again, it's going to be a case of um, looking for countries that have their own specific guidance and following that where where it's available. Thank you, Karen. I um, haven't got any more coming in at the moment. Let's give it a minute to see if there's anyone else who wants to ask a question. Okay. It might be a good opportunity, Karen, maybe to summarise the uh, two-day course that you do. Okay. Um, yeah, so in July and October this year, we've got um, a two-day course running on the registration of agrochemicals in the EU. Um, this is just a small snippet from what is covered in that course. Um, the course is a, an overview of the regulation. It looks at some of the history and new ideas and concepts that we have in the regulation. It talks through the procedures for applying for approval of active substances within the EU. And then on the second day, we focus more on the product side and looking at the, the zonal system and what the procedures are um, under the zonal system and also link that into the MRL's regulation. Um, so as I say, it, it's um, an introductory level course and it is basically an overview of the new regulation and the procedures that are involved in terms of gaining approval of your active substances and authorization of your products. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I've got an interesting question here. Someone said Brexit. How would this affect the UK? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I think that we um, we still need to uh, sort out how Brexit is going to affect the uh, the EU system. Um, my personal view is I would suspect that. Obviously, within the EU, nothing would change if the UK came out of the EU. Uh, I would suspect we would largely follow the EU system, but maybe get rid of some things we're not so keen on, like the comparative assessment, for example. Um, but that's my my guess at what would happen. I have absolutely no idea how Brexit would affect the regulation. I don't think many people do across all industries, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone in the UK has much no. idea of how it's affected no. anything. So. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's a good point to stop there then, I think. Um, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you, um, everyone, for your questions. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, thank you very much for attending.